And so moving right along here to the next McLuhan essay, this one is called Notes on the Media as Art Forms, and this is the next essay that he publishes after Culture Without Literacy in that journal Explorations that was put out by the University of Toronto. So this essay then appears in Explorations 2 in 1954, and uh, it's in this essay that uh, he begins to develop the idea that the medium is the message. Even though he doesn't use that phrase in this essay, it's clear that that's what he is setting out, uh, what he sets out in this essay to demonstrate, that it's the medium, not the content, uh, that is the message. And um, these essays in this anthology really do amount to a kind of missing book uh, that should exist in between The Mechanical Bride in 1951, in which uh, McLuhan is very good, but he, ha he hasn't developed his conceptual vocabulary yet. So mostly what he's concerned with in The Mechanical Bride are, are the contents of advertisements and uh, different media of the time. So he's talking about the content in that book, and he's not so much aware because at that point he hadn't read uh, Harold Innes's Empire and Communications, which was published in 1950. At that point he wasn't so much aware of the importance of the medium. But after reading Innes uh, and finishing The Mechanical Bride, he did become aware of it, and that's where, uh, that's the occasion, his reading of Innes, that prompted the writing of these essays. And they really do form a kind of missing book that should exist as a transitional evolutionary form in between the first book and the later Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media, which don't appear, as I said, for 10 and 12 years later, uh, where the concepts by the point that they appear are already all worked out. So uh, moving on then to this essay, he begins this essay by saying that the term mass media is a rather unfortunate term since all media are actually, including language, are actually forms of mass media. They're forms of mass communication. But he says that if we wanted just to restrict it to mass media as mechani mechanized media, then the first mechanized form of media was the printed book. And so the printed book was the first form of mechanized media. And um, he says the problem is that there has been very little discussion uh, about the differences between media because of the assumption uh, that information, that communication is simply about the transmission of information. Uh, and in this respect, I think he's, um, he's got to dig in here uh, at the Shannon Weaver model of, of communication in which we simply have a sender who sends a message and a, along a specific channel and a receiver who receives the message and in between there's some type of uh, information entropy content noise basically like static that degrades the message but what such models uh, don't take into account McLuhan is saying here is the form through which the message is going they don't take into, into account the medium that that message is going through and because people at this point in the 1950s, early 50s, were not yet sensitive to the different qualities of the media, the biases of the media, uh, to uh, well, Carol Dennis's, the title of his book, The Bias of Communication, because they weren't aware of the biases of the media, uh, there was no awareness uh, of the nature of, of the signal that's going through, that's, that's communicating uh, the message, and so it leads to uh, an inability to see this as even a problem. Uh, and so McLuhan really was the first to see that this is a, a problem. And he starts off by, by, whereas in the previous essay, in Culture Without Literacy, he had, he had talked about some of the salient structural features of manus the manuscript, uh, then the printed book, and then the newspaper. In this essay, he proceeds to discuss some of the salient characteristics of movies and television, uh, and also a couple of words about the advent of the paperback, uh, which was a new medium in the 50s at this time. Uh, and he starts off by saying that with the advent of television as a new communication medium, uh, it gives us some, an ability now as a new medium to contrast it with the earlier medium of cinema. And then he says, as the term Hollywood suggests, the nature of cinema is that it generates a pantheon of deities and divinities. Uh, cinema is an inherently mythical art form, and anything that, is, that goes through it is immediately transformed into the stuff of mythology. This was what I wrote about, by the way, in my book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, the myth-making power of, of, of cinema, and indeed of all media, as McLuhan will argue in this essay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, on the one hand, he, so he looks at the nature of the movie camera, and he says what the movie camera itself does is it analyzes, arrests, and dissects motion, analyzes it, and breaks it down into a series of still frames. Then the movie projector runs that movie and reconstructs the image and animates it. And what happens is that the movie camera breaks down the day world and the movie projector reassembles that day world into a night world of phantasmatic mythical images that retrieve the structure of the Platonic uh, Plato's cave, basically. And he says here that um, 
Plato and Hollywood join hands in a metaphoric dance on the sands of California. When we go into the movie theater, we're going into a, basically Plato's cave, and we are looking at phenomenal forms projected onto the wall in front of us, and they are larger than life, inherently mythical images. So anytime uh, anything is filmed, and it doesn't matter how banal it is or whether there's something as antiquated as a storyline, uh, Andy Warhol was the first to realize this about the camera, it automatically transforms and creates demigods and goddesses in the form of our modern celebrities. Um, then he says that, um, he goes on to contrast this then with, tele with television, but first he makes the point, uh, before he gets to that, he makes the point, uh, he says that um, Siegfried Gideon in Mechanization Takes Command had registered his perplexity at the fact in his chapter about the mechanization of bread, uh, the bread industry, about how when European immigrants came to America, they immediately preferred the American ersatz form of bread, the white bread, the wonder bread stuff. And that perplexed him, but he said, uh, McLuhan then says, well, it shouldn't perplex him because in a society under the conditions in which with advertising uh, in America, you have the transform, what advertising does is it transforms ordinary everyday objects into fetish objects that gleam and glow with numinous uh, pseudo-religious energies. And the power of the media, all media does this, it takes objects and turns them into works of art simply by removing them from their contexts and advertising them, putting them into a new, into a new medium. And so in this sense, all media are, are forms of art. All media are art forms. So McLuhan doesn't necessarily make a distinction between art and media. He sees them as interchangeable in many ways, as long as you're understanding what the differences are of each, uh, of each medium. And so he says it shouldn't be any surprise then that under the technological conditions of a consumer society in which the, the whole culture is transformed at every level into a gigantic Aladdin's cave, uh, that it shouldn't be any surprise that we would prefer the ersatz even at the level of physical taste. So that should come as no surprise. And then he goes on to say how when television, for example, first came out, um, people would gather in front of shop windows and they would look at the image on the screen. They would gather in crowds and look at the image on the screen no matter how banal the image was and they would just sort of stare in awe at it, even if it was an image of, of traffic out on the street. Because there again, the medium was creating a, a, a myth a mythic image simply by taking a banal image and filtering it through a medium that transforms it instantly into a fetish object and turns it into something radiant with uh, numinous potential. Then he goes on from that and he contrasts then uh, film, the film process with the television and he says that television is a very different modality, it's a very different medium from film. If we contrast uh, the movie camera, the movie camera uh, analyzes reality by breaking it down into a series of still shots, whereas the TV video monitor has a continuous pickup, a continuous feed. It's not discrete. It has a continuous feed that's more analogous to the way a microphone functions in relation to the human voice. And so it's very different already from the start. And then he says the end result is also different. In the case of a movie theater, what you're looking at is an image that is projected on a screen in front of you, whereas with a television, you, the spectator, become the screen and television is the projector that projects its image onto you. And it's a very low resolution, highly tactile image uh, that projects this uh, onto you in a pointless dance of electrons, uh, the ballet of the electrons, as McLuhan puts it. So it's very different. And then um, this does suggest his later distinction between light through and light on, where he talks about uh, light through. Television is basically a self-luminous form of technology. It exhibits like stained glass the phenomenon of light through or the illuminated manuscript, whereas film uh, exhibits a certain vestigial uh, relationship to the Gutenbergian world with its idea of light on, projecting light on a flat surface. Uh, there's a kind of vestigial relationship there to the Gutenbergian world. You have to shed light on a printed page in order to see it. So they're two very different media. And television represents, in, in that sense, a rupture, a sudden discontinuity, and the beginnings, really, of the kind of uh, hyper-electronic age that we're living in now that's different from the pre-World War II electric age. And with World War II, we have the creation of electronics technologies, which emerged out of uh, World War II, mostly uh, a creation at Stanford uh, in, uh, <coughs> in California. And so we now exist in an electronic world that was really first configured with television. There was, of course, radio before it, but it's television that really configures this, this world of self-luminous rectangles that we are now surrounded by. And I would point out that Mark Rothko's late paintings, uh, in which he paints a series of self-luminous rectangles, 
is already prophetic of the environment that we are surrounded with now. Self-luminous rectangles are everywhere we look nowadays. And so the artist is always a jump or two ahead of what actually is coming down the road. Just as Jackson Pollock's action paintings, for example, are already prefigurations of the idea of self-organization from noise in chaos and complexity theory, where noise uh, is the beginnings of a system that spontaneously self-organizes and creates a new phase change that creates a system with emergent properties. Uh, Pollock was really painting that in his, in his drip paintings, I think. But uh, anyway, um, so then he goes on after this contrast and he says that it was really Erasmus who was the first to see the potential of the printed book for the classroom, that it had the potential to revolutionize uh, the classroom and the way education uh, was conducted. And he says, likewise, today, the new media that we are surrounded with have put us into a situation of a classroom without walls now. Uh, in this phrase, he borrows from Andre Malraux's Museum Without Walls. Uh, in Malraux's book, The Voices of Silence, uh, the opening chapter there is on the Museum Without Walls, where Malraux talks about how the advent of photography fundamentally changed the nature of art by making it possible for the first time to create images of works of art and to make them portable and remove them from the walls of museums and put them into books and put them directly into your lap. So that it created, uh, photography basically created a museum without walls. Uh, and it changed, uh, Malraux was also very sensitive in that book to uh, the nuances of how photographic images change the semiotics of the work of art uh, that they portray. John Berger borrows from this for his famous video documentary, Ways of Seeing. For example, a, a photograph of a close-up of a something small like a coin can render that uh, in such a way as to make it look like it's a much more larger monumental image. And indeed, in many photographs of works of art, photographs of statues, um, they, they, the size of the statue is not conveyed, and sometimes small tiny works that can be held in the hand can look like monumental works of art in a photograph in a book, which is something that I found to my astonishment when I went to go to museums and see lots of these works of art that I had already seen in these, in these books and was surprised by how small many of them were, or in the case of Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, how large that canvas was. It, it, that thing was huge, and no picture of Demoiselle ever really does justice to the monumentality of that image or to the monumentality of the size of images like uh, Francis Bacon's paintings, for example. So photography changes the semiotics, and Malraux was already sensitive to the fact that the medium is the message there. He was already sensitive to it without being consciously aware of the fact that he was sensitive to it. Uh, so then McLuhan goes on to talk about, after um, Erasmus, he then goes on to talk about how in America what happened was that the European educational apparatus was transplanted the, the, the book culture, the culture of the printed book, was transplanted into America minus the manuscript tradition, and conversation came over minus the milieu of the plastic arts. And as a result of that, it laid the basis for our technology. The, the abstract book page became the matrix from out of which American technology emerged, and which then paradoxically over time actually ended up creating an art and architecture that was anything or that is anything but abstract. It's very sensuous. And then he says that in Europe, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's an emphasis on uh, a vocal, a, verbi a verbal and vocal tradition that is a carryover from the oral, uh, a vestigial residue from the oral manuscript traditions in Europe. And that the Europeans, when they inherit our culture, they have to build bridges that translate sports and jazz and machines into their own form language, just as we have had to translate European art into our language. In, in many respects, McLuhan was doing in philosophy here, in, in the theory of media, what the abstract expressionists were doing at the same time in the 40s and 50s in New York, which was to say they were importing European art and making it palatable for America. Uh, McLuhan was really the first, I think, to begin to understand the European modernist avant-garde tradition and to make it acceptable and understandable to the American palate by relating its aesthetics to American pop, American pop art. Uh, so McLuhan is doing basically in uh, literature and nonfiction what the abstract expressionists were doing uh, in, in art, in high art, importing Euro-modernism, Euro-avant-garde. Um, and so he says that we have to build bridges between these different media, but then once the bridge has been crossed, you no longer need it anymore, so you can do away with it. But he says that <clears throat> nowadays uh, such bridges such bridges are, are necessary not only between cultures but within our own culture since we need to develop uh, a new discourse, a new language that can understand 
the differences between the different media.